first thing they actually they were saying was, we just don't understand what these people are angry about. I mean, things are going really well. Why would American citizens possibly be angry? Um, and of course, if you are a high-ranking employee of, of, of major corporations making several million dollars a year, um, you know things like mass joblessness and homelessness and foreclosures is not something that's in your personal range of experience. And then the, then the issue became, um, we don't understand what their message is. What do these people want? Um, and, and, they're, and they're a bit scruffy. Yeah, they're they're kind of crusty and dirty. And you know, the whole idea of what do these people want was even too stupid for our political discourse because you could, for example, begin with the name Occupy Wall Street. That sort of gave a hint about what the message was. And then there were all these people with signs, sort of angry about the fact that the very same people who had wrecked the entire world economy and destroyed economic security for huge numbers of people not only didn't pay any price for having done that, but profited greatly. That was sort of an obvious message as well. But for people in these situations, they actually, that's not within the realm of experience. That fulfillment that they had was genuine. They weren't intending. <laughs> and that's why I thought that, for example, when Aaron Burnett, who um, has this new CNN show, um, went on and, and spouted just the most patronizing, sneering, scornful um, you know, hatred on, on the protesters, I went and I looked at Erin Burnett's life just to sort of see where she was coming from. What I found was that she was raised in one of the most affluent suburbs in America, went to the second most expensive private school um, in the country, went to work for Goldman Sachs very nobly after graduating college, um, and is now in engaged to the second or third highest ranking executive at Citigroup. Um, and so is it really a surprise that Erin Burnett looks at people protesting Wall Street with such scorn? Um, you know, she would tell you that she's the beacon of objectivity. All of you people here are biased, you're subjective, you have your own partisan blinders that you've, but not her, she's objective, she's a journalist. And yet her experience has made her um, sort of the living, breathing, oozing embodiment of this extreme socioeconomic bias. And that's what led her to do this, is she's an insider, and that's what journalism has become. And then the other example um, that you know was sort of a leading figure who scorned the protest movement was Bill Keller, the longtime executive editor of the New York Times, and he had decided that this protest movement was just boring. It was like very dreary, like having you people go out so and complain. Yeah. yeah, and it's just like he has his entertainment, things that he finds fulfilling, and this is just not it. You're boring him. And I actually <laughs> learned yesterday for the first time, and this was so illuminating, there was a New Yorker profile about his successor at the New York Times, Jill Abramson, um, and in there it talked about what happened when the New York Times made the announcement that Jill Abramson would replace Bill Keller, and it said on the day that it happened, Bill Keller was standing there in his charcoal gray suit and his charcoal gray hair, and he was very upright, and he looked like the CEO and chairman of Chevron, which coincidentally enough was the position that his father had served in for a long time. Um, so why is the son of the CEO of Chevron and the fiance of the second highest ranking um, executive at Citigroup scornful of Wall Street protesters, it's because this is who our media class is. They are integrated fully into the political class and are dependent upon and eager to serve those in power rather than um, serve as watchdogs over them. And that's why they lead the way in demanding that there be no investigations, demanding there be no accountability, because these are their friends. These are their safe play buddies. These are the people they admire. Well, even here in liberal San Francisco, as we all know from reading the Chronicle every day, it has maintained a relentless drumbeat against the Occupy movements, uh, again and again calling on the mayors of both Oakland and San Francisco to clear out the encampments. And when they didn't, the other 12 page the other day started to pray for rain, uh, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> Uh, again, this is a you know, shame, uh, shameless plug, why we need an independent media, right, Glenn? Yeah. Let's talk about that uh, ongoing conundrum known as Barack Hussein Obama. Right. Uh, speaking of progressive journalists who drank Kool-Aid, uh, I was one of those uh, back in 2008. We all had high hopes, or not we all, I don't want to speak for all of you, but I certainly did, had high hopes for Obama. He spoke, uh, he, you know, as if he was one of us. He was a masterful, uh, you know, uh, purveyor of that rhetoric. He, in fact, said he was a, a staunch critic of the torture regime of the Bush administration and said he would end it. But once he was elected, it was a very different story. What, what's your understanding of what the hell happened there? <laughs> 
I mean, I think it's very difficult to assess other people's motives um, and what drives them. I think it's actually difficult to assess our own motives. You know, all human beings are complex and driven by a whole bunch of complicated, interrelated drives. But what I think is pretty clear, just based on the evidence, it doesn't require much psychological speculation or speculation of any kind, is what Barack Obama has said about himself which is that essentially his entire life has been driven by a tactic or strategy of accommodating rather than confronting <coughs> institutional authority. So if you look at his life, I mean, he went to Harvard Law School and he wasn't one of the people doing sit-ins in the dean's office. He was on Harvard Law Review, making connections with Sav Cass Sunstein, networking with you know professors who could help his career. Um, he did the same thing while on the Illinois State Senate. As soon as he got to the US Senate, he immediately sought out Joe Lieberman as his mentor um, and prided himself on working with Republicans like Richard Lugar. He was clearly this figure who was not interested in disrupting or subverting the process of power, but integrating himself into it in order to rise within it. And he's a very adept politician, and what adept politicians by definition can do is tell you the things that you want to hear. And even if there's somebody across the room who wants to hear something radically different than you want to hear, both of you will think that you're hearing what you want to hear. That's the talent that he has. That's the defining attribute of a politician. So a lot of us believed in the promise of Obama because we wanted to. There was an eagerness, a desire to believe that politics and electoral politics specifically, and working for the Democratic Party and a Democratic politician would bring this political elevation. And the way he was presented um, and presented himself was this urban, enlightened, progressive, constitutional scholar. It sort of, on a cultural level, um, you know, really resonated with lots of people on both coasts and, and with, um, I think, blue state culture, the way that George Bush's evangelicalism did with red state. Um, voter. So it was really kind of a cultural and psychological um, appeal more than it was empirical or rational, which is, you know, how human beings react to things. Um, and I think that what has happened um, is that he got into power and decided that he wanted to stay in power. Um, and the way that you stay in power is not by confronting the country's most powerful factions, but by giving them what they want, by accommodating them and and serving them or not waging political battles that um, are gratuitous or don't need to be waged. So for example, in the areas that I write most about, in civil liberties, terrorism, and foreign policy and the like, um, you know, the most disturbing part to me about all of this is that you know, if three years ago we had assembled in this room 100 people, 50 of whom considered themselves Republicans and 50 of them considered themselves Democrats, and I were to get up, and I did this, so I know, I'm not speculating, and I were to get up and I would talk about things like um, killing people with no due process, or radical secrecy doctrines, or expanding wars in the Muslim world through drone attacks, um, or denying torture victims and other war and terror victims their right to even have their claims heard in a court. 50% um, of that room would be incredibly supportive of those things. They would cheer for them, they would justify them, those were called Republicans. 50% of the room, the ones calling themselves Democrats, um, would feign anger over these things and would express very virulent objections and call it shredding the Constitution and radicalism and the like, um, and I saw that too. If now, three years later, you assemble that same exact group into a room, and if I were to stand up and talk about all of those things, probably 90% of the room would be supportive of it or would find ways to mitigate it at least or justify it or apologize for it, maybe 10% of the room um, would be virulently angry over it because they actually were angry the first time over the actual policy and not just using it opportunistically to harm the other party. And this, to me, has been the most significant, consequential, and probably most enduring aspect of the Obama legacy, this idea that by taking these policies that have previously been considered right, quite recently, very controversial, divisive policies, the sort of hallmark of right-wing radicalism, and converting it into bipartisan consensus, the orthodoxy of all parties, what he has done is remove so many of these policies from the realm of debate and has entrenched them for at least a generation in the way that George Bush and, and Dick Cheney never could have. And I just want to add one point about that, which is there's this report that's fascinating. And I wrote about it once at the time, but I don't think I gave it enough attention given its importance because I didn't realize it at the time. But it was a report written by the CIA, and it was classified by them as top secret. Um, and like so many things like it. It was leaked to WikiLeaks, which then published it immediately. And um, what this report talked about was it described the fears on the part of national security state planners that what it was happening in Western Europe was that extreme levels of opposition to the war in Afghanistan had caused a couple of governments like in the Netherlands to fall. 
And they were worried that other Western European governments, because of a rising tide of war opposition, would feel compelled to withdraw to protect themselves, and that this might even eventually infect the United States and cause a premature withdrawal from Afghanistan. Premature withdrawal in war sense means that at some point we leave, that we don't stay forever. Um, and, and the national security state was very worried about this, but what it said was, this is January of 2009, before Obama was inaugurated, but obviously after he had won the election, was that they no longer were as concerned about that because now that it, these wars would have the face of Obama on them, um, that it would diffuse opposition in Western Europe because he was so wildly popular there and they would be convinced that someone like him would never prosecute an unjust war. And it would do the same to American public opinion as well, that it would shield these policies that under Bush had become these um, repellent policies done by this unilateralist swaggering cowboy. It would convert it into progressive policies because of his face now representing it. And that has been the prime value to these factions from an Obama presidency. That's why they supported him. It's why Wall Street poured money into his campaign. And I think that that was what he went there to do. So in a sense, there's something even more sinister about an Obama administration because it does have this patina of enlightenment in some way. I think it, it, you know, it, it, tra it has transformed public opinion on a whole variety of questions. And um, one of, in a way that Republicans couldn't. And one of the key areas that you've been so eloquent about uh, condemning, I think, is Obama's embrace of the policy of assassinating U.S. citizens. Uh, we recently saw the, the Muslim cleric uh, killed in a drone strike, uh, and his son as well. His 16-year-old son two weeks later. That's right. Uh, you've been very eloquent about condemning that, uh, Glenn. Do you think, that, again, this is a, a serious escalation in, in, in sort of the uh, tyranny of American power around the world? There, there's no question about that. I mean, if, you, if, if I were to say to you five years ago, what is the single most radical power that any government could assert? And if I were to ask the other people this question 50 years ago or 100 years ago, the answer would be the same. It would be the power of a leader by himself in secrecy with no due process or obligation for them evidence to mark citizens for death, for killing, for assassination. This, I mean, if you if you look at what the controversies were of the Bush era that caused so many Democrats and progressives to run around screaming that the Constitution was being shredded and that radicalism was upon us, they were angry about things like George Bush spying on the communication of American citizens without warrant, without judicial oversight, or George Bush asserting the power simply to detain American citizens without due process like he did with Jose Garcia, that was incredibly controversial. It came from among progressives. It was almost a, a consensus unanimously that this was a heinous assault on our core values and was anti-democratic. And yet here is Barack Obama asserting the power not to eavesdrop on American citizens without due process, not to detain American citizens without due process, but to target them for assassination, far from any battlefield, regardless of what they're doing at the time, that they're doing it without charging them with any crime, without presenting evidence, or that they've done anything wrong, without even accounting for what it is that, they, that, that, that they're doing in terms of the principles that are guiding them. That is literally the most radical, the most tyrannical power that a government can possibly assert. Um, and it's being asserted with very little controversy, very little backlash, and very little opposition. And I think that's because the people who would ordinarily oppose that policy are the people who are supportive of that policy and want to see him reelected. And I don't think George Bush could have gotten away with asserting that power. I think that aligned with his agenda. And yet no major American politician has the uh, courage to stand up on the floor of Congress as Robert Kennedy did during the uh, Vietnam War in 1968, breaking from his own party, his own president, and in a beautiful speech, condemn uh, the, the bombing, uh, indiscriminate bombing in Vietnam, and use words like, what gave America the right to play God to rain death from above on a civilian population? And that's precisely, of course, what's going on right now in countries all around the world that, as you say, are, are far removed from any battlefield. Yeah, I mean, well, one of the things that, that happened, and you know, it's interesting because as somebody who's worked on civil liberties for a long time, first as a lawyer, now as a writer, one of the things that typically is done that are the, the primary tactic that power factions use to erode, erode rights is that they will single out certain individuals who are so marginalized and hated in order to abridge the rights um, of that individual with the expectation that nobody will really care because they're so hated. 
Um, and yet, what, every, what happens in every single case, the reason why you have to go and defend it when it's done in that instance is because once that happens, it becomes normalized. It becomes entrenched. The power becomes accepted and legitimized and then gets expanded to less and less compelling cases. It always expands powers once they're I started like that, and what's interesting is, you know, when in, in researching for the book, I wanted to figure out, for example, what was um, the uh, sort of origin of this idea that elites should be held in, uh, 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 immune under the rule of law when they get caught committing crimes, even the most egregious crimes. And what I found was that the first instance was where this was really explicitly promulgated was the Ford part from Richard Nixon. That was when Ford went on television. Um, and he was very uncomfortable having to justify this because he knew it was shameful and wrong. Um, and what he said was, he went on TV and he said, look, I believe very firmly in the rule of law. The rule of law is no respecter of persons, um, which is the kind of crux of what the rule of law means. And then he added this concocted amendment designed to gut that principle that he had just invoked. And he said, but the law is a respecter of reality meaning that if things are too disruptive, if there's too much distraction, if there's too much turbulence from prosecuting elites, then we hold them, um, then we, we invest them with immunity. And lots of people, you know, well-intentioned people, people who are generally sympathetic to the things that we're talking about, actually thought that the Ford pardon of Nixon was a good thing to do because it was necessary for the country to move on. The problem is, is that once you accept that, it becomes normalized, and that's what we've seen is subsequent to that, that same rationale being invoked over and over. That's why things like the Wallace assassination of Anwar Awaki, um, even if you are convinced, even though you've never seen any evidence of it and the government hasn't shown any evidence, even if somehow mystically you believe that Awaki really is involved in actual operational planning of terrorist plotting, you should still vehemently oppose the power of the government to assassinate your fellow citizens without due process because inevitably, that will expand and it will grow and maybe there'll be a leader and there will be a leader whom you don't trust quite as much as Barack Obama and if you stand and cheer when Milwaukee is murdered or other Wallace acts happen because you like the result, um, then you'll essentially be responsible for those subsequent applications that you find most palatable. The rule of law, not of man. Right, yeah.